All right, now for the main event. Tonight I want to talk to you about how to pitch to funders and investors. <coughs> I guess everybody here knows me by now, right? I'm Lex McCusker. I'm the director of the business plan. I was going to sing. I was going to do my best Teddy Pender guess, right? Teddy you don't know. Oh. <laughs> Not even. All right. So let's talk about things. First of all, just by way of context, I'm going to tell you a model of pitching to investors. It's one model. It's the one I like. And I'll tell you, I have seen hundreds of these pitches, literally hundreds. And I've probably done 20 of them myself. I have a point of view about this. Um, it's just a model. It's not perfect the way it is. You, you are certainly going to have to adapt it to your venture and to this context. <coughs> I will talk about it, though, in a way that, that optimizes it for the pitch competition. Right? So I'll tell you things that, that if you were pitching VCs downtown would be different than if you're going to pitch the judges on April 14th. It's also a structure that's suitable for social entrepreneurship and general entrepreneurship. There are some differences. I would say the overlap is, is about 90%. I will point out some places where, where the socials should do different things. I do recognize my bias, though. So if, 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 I, if I'm short, getting short shrift to the social entrepreneurship side, like in areas like competition, ask a question, pull me up, make, make sure I'm make sure keep me honest on that. And I will take a little bit of time toward the end to show you some other approaches. There are lots of approaches out there. There are lots of pitch coaches, people who, who are experts in this, and you can find them online. I'll recommend three of them for you. Now, here's, here's an important message. Anybody can do a great pitch. I absolutely guarantee, guarantee that anybody can do a great pitch. And I, that makes it even easier, because the, the talent that's in this room, I know you guys can do a great pitch. Even if you've never want, done one by yourself, I will show you a template that you can follow, and you will be very, you'll be very much on target if you follow this template. <coughs> you certainly don't have to, and, and the more you personalize it and make it your own, the better you'll do. But I guarantee I can get you to where you can make a great pitch. The secret is to connect, to connect with the audience. And how do you do that? There's lots of techniques that I'm talking about over the next hour. The meta message is be yourself. Just be who you are. Let, let the real you come through. That's my, that's my slogan. That's my tagline. <coughs> show them who you are. And the other, the other thing that's important is, is show affection for your venture. If you don't love what you're doing, they won't love it either. <coughs> it's infectious. It's, and it's not a rational thing. It's not, it's not going through the right brain where they're thinking about it. It's going through the left brain where they're feeling it. And they've got to feel that you love this venture. And when they feel that, they'll love it too. And you've got to give them some love. Give them respect. Give them politeness. Show them that you have an interest in them, and they will reciprocate. <coughs> the other secret to this, and it's no secret, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Mm, practice. practice, practice, practice. If you don't do this, your talk, 10 times, and I don't mean like flipping through the slides 10 times. I mean standing up in front of the mirror standing up in front of your mother, videotaping it, doing it with a watch, over and over again, you will have trouble on the 14th. We'll talk about that a lot, but promise me now, let's all swear an oath. I, I do solemnly swear, I'm going to do this 10 times from end to end. You've got to practice at this, and I'll tell you more about that. All right, so here's the agenda. Uh, start with an executive summary. You, you, you wouldn't expect anything less, right? Then I've got eight other topics. I want to talk about preparation, which you should be doing now in advance of the, of, of the, of the event. I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about the judges and what are the judges judging. Important question. I'm going to think about it a little bit. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the narrative arc. You think you're doing a pitch. You think you're doing nuts and bolts. You think you're, you're conveying information. You're not. You're telling a story. You want to write a script that's compelling. You want to write a drama that has arc and flow and characters and passion. That's what's going to make you successful. And I will talk about that in the context of the narrative arc. Then I'm going to do nuts and bolts again. I'm going to show you a pitch deck. I'm going to show you an 18 slide deck, an outline of 18 slide deck that can be delivered in 12 minutes. And the topics that you should talk about. If you've never done a pitch like this in your life, you don't know where to start. Start with this 18 slide deck. I think, I guarantee it won't be exactly what you want. You're going to have to adapt it. 
But that's, if you've got nothing to start with right now, that'll get you off the ground. Then I want to talk about the Q&A. 12 minutes of questions of, of presentation, 8 minutes of Q&A, right? 40% of the time, of your precious time, is Q&A. You've got to make good use of that, and I'll show you how. Then finally, as I promised, I will show you three other approaches quickly. I'll give you some websites, some reference, some video. You can go see how other people do this. I'll talk about the Audience Choice Award, so I'll, I'll finally answer your question more directly. <laughs> what do you do in that five-minute pitch against, with 250 people in, in the auditorium and how that's different from 12 judges sitting in front of you, right? And then finally, I want to spend the last 20 minutes or so talking about general things about any presentation, right? First, first eight things here are about how you pitch to investors. Then I'm going to do a little bit <coughs> about how you pitch to anybody on any topic the general things about you, your presence, the slides you use, the gestures you make. All right? So do all that general stuff. All right? Everybody got the game plan? Nobody's leaving yet? All right, let's go for it. So, executive summary. Here's the essence. If you have to leave after this slide, you'll at least gotten the overview. Start fast. Get their attention right away. Get them oriented. They don't know you from Adam. They don't know what you're going to talk about. They don't know if you're going to talk about toilets in India or streaming audio or, or what. They don't know if you're old or young. Well, that'll be yes, right? They don't know if you're techie. They don't know if you're social or general. You've got to get them oriented right away. Get them grounded. We'll talk about how to do that. And you've got 30 seconds to do it. They're coming in there and they're making a... I see you taking a picture Can of this. Can I do that? Absolutely. But I, I want, you want to say that the slides are on the website already. Okay. And so you, so I, they're there now. Uh, if, if you can't get them off the website for some reason, I'll send them to you. You don't have to do this if you don't want to. You're certainly welcome to. Okay. Right. Then you get your narrative. You've got to get them hooked, what I call get them up the hill. You've got to get them excited about your problem, that this <coughs> is a really important problem. This is something that you really understand. And you've got a solution for it. You've got to get them up, 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 and don't let them come down. Don't let them start to worry about all the things that could go wrong. So get them up the hill, don't let them come down, and then close the deal. And that's the narrative arc that I'm going to talk about later. Right? There's a flow and a drama to it. That's what you want to achieve in your 12 minutes. All right? Now, next topic, preparation. Know your audience. Seems obvious, but that's important. <coughs> Who are you talking to in this, in that 12 minutes? You're talking to 12 judges. And I'll show you. You have the profiles, right? Did I give them? Do you have oh, the Yes, you have them. Give me a minute. I'll, I'll give them out in a minute. Don't, don't look at that yet. This is, this is, this is the reason for, for handouts, by the way. And the lesson we'll talk about later. Judge, in, so these folks are investors and funders, right? There's some, some, some not-for-profit social investors, some VCs, all people who are looking to, to, to invest, invest in you. And investors are a special kind of people. They are funny, funny people. They are risk takers and risk mitigators. They're gamblers and they're cautious. All in the same person, you know? So thing one is, is, is the risk taker. They're always looking for the next big thing. Part of the reason they come to this, they love GW and they love you, they're hoping that you're going to show them the next big thing that they can invest in. That's what they live for. They spend time seeing hundreds of these pitches because they want to find that next big, big thing, and they think there's a chance that at this GW competition, they're going to see it. That's what they live for. The harsh reality is they see hundreds of these pitches, and <coughs> most of them don't include the next big thing. But when they find it, when they're hooked, when you get them up the hill and they really are excited about what you got, they flip. They change. They become thing two. The other little mischievous character. Now they're risk, risk mitigators. Now they're saying, holy cow, how many ways can this go wrong? They get hypercritical and they start to look for all the holes in your so you're, going to, you're giving talks to, to, it's the same 12 people, but it's really 24 people, because halfway through they're going to flip. Mm -hmm. right? 
Bear this in mind because you've, <coughs> you've got to feed them what they eat. You've got to give them what they want. You've got to get them up that hill, get them excited, and you've got to keep them from coming down the hill when they start to, when they start to panic. All right. Here's the names. Okay, everybody's got a handout. You, you have little pictures and profiles of them. Um, I'm not going to go through who these people are. This is part of your homework. I got to tell you, spend time on the internet, research these people, find out who they are, find out what they do, find out what they like and what they care <coughs> about. I'll tell you quickly. Dana Barsky is a private investor, worked for many years at, uh, at Credit Suisse, big corporation, worked in Golden Seeds. Who knows what Golden Seeds is? Find out what Golden Seeds is, because that's an investment company that specializes in women entrepreneurs. She's going to care about women. Life is, fi life, <laughs> no, life is tough. Figure out who they are. Mary Galletti is, a, is another investor, a, a social entrepreneurship investor. Dan Gordon is with Valhalla Partners. Dan Gordon's a technical whiz. Dan loves the technology. Uh, Darius Graham runs the Social Innovation Lab at Hopkins. Uh, Roger Krekov, another, another venture capitalist. Uh, let's see. Michael Quinn sponsored the International Prize. You think he cares about international? Dig in on these guys, right? Uh, Peter Weissman's an attorney. What's he going to care about? Intellectual property, right? He's going to know, he's going to know what your patents are, right? What's your competitive advantage? You're going to know your corporate structure, right? It's not rocket science. Feed them what they eat. Make sure you know that, that you cover the stuff that these guys are going to be interested in. All right. The other thing of preparation is obviously look at the criteria, right? This is the criteria. This is uh, general and social, very much, very much parallel. <coughs> stuff you would expect, right? Your, your customer segments and your market opportunity, value proposition, management capability means the team, right? Everybody wants to know about the team. They don't want to see your finances. If you're on the general side, they're going to see how you make lots and lots of money, right? If you're on the social side, they're going to want to see how you sustain your venture, how you manage to do good but also pay the, pay the rent, right? Got to show them this stuff. Investment potential, would they invest in, in your venture is one of the questions we're going to ask them. Notice the last 25 points here <coughs> is around, all around the presentation. Right? It's around stuff you, you haven't even started on yet. So they're going to look for your presentation and your enthusiasm. They're going to look for your persuasiveness right? and the quality of your materials. Right? So focus. Tonight we're really working on that last 25%. And it's, and it's heavily weighted in the, in the scoring, right? OK. All right, next. Next agenda item. What are the judges judging? OK, quiz. What are the judges judging? Come on. Presentation. <coughs> oh. Your venture? <laughs> Who said that? Your plan? They are judging you. <laughs> they are judging you. They bet on the jockey, not on the horse. You ever heard that expression? Mm -hmm. They want an A, they, they'll take an A team with a B plan <coughs> over a B, a B plan. They'll take an A team with a B plan any day <laughs> over a B team with an A plan. Right? <coughs> so it's all about you. No pressure. Now, what do they care about? Oh, oh who's, no, it's integrity. 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 The thing they care about most is integrity. Why do they care about integrity? Why is that at the top of their list? They're, they're putting their money at risk and the, th the way they can get hurt is by somebody double dealing them. <coughs> so the thing they care about most is that you are honest. Don't do anything that gives them a sense that you are anything less than 100% in integrity. Don't hem and haw, don't fib, don't exaggerate. Don't say it's sunny out if it's not. Because that's what, in the, they, and they'll never tell you this, in the back of their minds, that's what every one of them is worrying about. Second thing. All right, smart guy, I didn't put it up there now. What's the second thing they care about? Charisma. Passion. You, you guys are going to do all right. If you're not passionate about their venture, about your venture, 
they're never going to be passionate about their venture. If you're not committed and enthusiastic about <coughs> making money with this thing or saving the world or doing whatever you are going to do with your venture, they're never going to be. They're judging your passion. Lots of other things. They're looking for experience and accomplishment. Talk about your accomplishments. Even many of you are young, haven't started a business, maybe not. Talk about things you've accomplished, especially around building an organization. Talk about your knowledge and education. Right? Got a master's degree in public health from the George Washington University. That says something about your knowledge. Right? Talk about your skills. Don't be af afraid to talk about skills that you think might be peripherally related. If you had a lemonade stand when you were a kid, that matters. Why does that matter? It matters because most entrepreneurs have the bug very early on, and they show it when they're eight years old. If you have that and have that track record, mention it. Right? They're looking for leadership commitment. They want to see that you have a vision, that you really can have some kind of a sense of the future, but that you're realistic. Tough balance, right? Because I'm asking you to to, to talk about things that could be, but, but, stay, but stay plausible. And then finally, the thing that last on my list, but that is really important to them, is they want people who are coachable. They want to know that you listen to them. So you'll get, you'll get questions that are testing your coachability. The question itself is, is, is not important. They want to see how you, res, how you respond to a suggestion. They'll say, why don't you, have you thought about going into, um, selling this in New York City instead of Boston. And they don't care if you sell New York City or Boston. They want to see how you, how you react to that. They want to see if you're thoughtful and you say, yes, we've considered that. Or no, we haven't considered that, but it's an interesting idea. There's a lot of pluses and minuses around Boston and, 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 and New York. New York has many more people. Boston has a lot more snow. I'm saying stupid things, but show that you're listening and you're coachable, right? Because they care about that. All right? Yes, sir. Um, question about that last thing, Joe, I mean, being short, James, trying to what happened. Um, I know the coachability, they don't necessarily like to know it all, but sometimes if you seem like you wave with the wind of like, you know, oh yeah, oh yeah, like, you know, I realize that can be distracted, so where's the balance of those numbers? Yeah. Coachability, so thank you, Jeffrey. Coachability doesn't mean that you bend with the breeze, go with everything they say. The right response to a suggestion is, yes, we've thought about that. Here's how we've raised, here's how we've evaluated the pros and cons, and we think we should, uh, we, and here's why we think this is the right way to go. But it's an interesting idea. Thank you for suggesting that. Or, and I'd like to follow up with you afterwards and talk to you some more about it. I am really we can interested. do that. Right? Yeah. Right. Don't, yeah, don't be a pushover. I mean, okay. Sir. So some things I've read about pitching were like, don't, make it about you so how do you incorporate your qualification statement like where in the pitch deck do you say oh I have a master degree or whatever without it looking like it's a bio about yourself so I I'm, I'm willing to uh, to acknowledge there are lots of different approaches to these kind of pitches uh -huh. I'll give you a big argument about whether or not it's about you I don't think you can ever do a successful pitch to a funder or an investor that isn't primarily or largely about you. So yeah, we'll have to disagree about that. So, but the, do you bundle all this in one spot, or do you try to weave it in? The simple answer, the I, when, I show you, when I show you my proposed deck, I have it in two places. Okay. I don't weave it all the way through. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. So um, for our team, we have two full-time faculty, one student, Their expectation is that full-time faculty will not go with the venture. Okay. They believe, it's, it's a rare academic that says, I can't wait to give up my tenure job at GW <laughs> so I can go out and risk everything on this venture. I mean, if that's true, say it, because they'll, 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 they might, they might get, actually get a hug right there on the spot, right? Because when that happens, it's a beautiful thing. Nobody expects that. At the other extreme, at the other extent, the people who are not full-time academics, if you say I'm going to work on this nights and weekends, 
or I'm going to work on this part time, they're going to yawn at you because that's not the level of commitment they're looking for. Now, bear in mind some of the ground rules here. These are not investors investing their own money, right? This is a little bit of, 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 of theater, right? We've asked them to, to act like investors and to, and to take a fiduciary responsibility for how they dispense GW's money in the business plan, right? So the standards will be a little bit relaxed. But I gotta tell you, if you're coming to an investor and saying, I want to take your money and invest it in this company, but I'm only gonna work on it part time, they don't want to hear it. They want to hear you're going to work on it 80 hours a week and you're going to eat, eat ramen noodles and uh, stay in, in, you know, manacled to that computer until the thing is built, right? They want commitment like over the top. Is that helpful? No, 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 because you have a team. No, because you have a team. You said we have a team of four people. Okay, so. I, here, here's, and I don't know what the roles are, but, but. Um, Fred is a, is, is a professor at the medical school. He's going to be the chief technical advisor and will work uh, on the issues of getting us through the clinical trial. He will do that part-time while he's also on the faculty at GW. Mary is the CEO of the company. She will be working full-time on this, including building the website, uh, selling the product, and hiring three more people. And so, so the different roles. I think that, so the sh crisper answer to your question would be, you need to have at least one person on your team who is really committed to this. And it's okay for the others to have part-time roles. Right. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about David S. Rose. Um, let me just point out quickly a video. This is, this is uh, on, on, on YouTube. David S. Rose is, a, is one of the best uh, uh, investors, angel investors in the world. David S. Rose has studied investors and pitching uh, like anthropologists, uh, you know, study primitive peoples, you know, like, like Jane Goodall studying the apes. He knows more about pitching than anybody. And this video, much of what I'm talking about here, I stole from him, and you should look at this video. All right. Next, the narrative arc. All right, let me talk about the narrative arc. Now we'll get, we'll get, we'll get somewhere now. Here's the narrative arc. Your pitch is a drama in five acts. Okay. Put on your... Director's hat, right? Clipboard. Maestro, please. The first act is, there's a big important problem out there. Or there's a really big opportunity out there. Pay attention. Big opportunity. Big, big, big. And I understand this problem. And it might not be a problem, right? So if, you, if you're pitching, if it's, if it's the, you know, 10 years ago and you're pitching the iPad, the iPod, don't say there's a big problem out there, right? You know? People are dying to have a thousand songs in their pocket. They can't live without it. That wasn't the problem. But there was an opportunity, right? People love music. They want to have their music with them. There's a big opportunity out there. And not only do, and we really understand these people and their problem. We know how they're dealing with it now. And we can tell you, because we've done a lot of research, the magnitude of this problem in quantitative terms. Okay. Pushing them up the hill, right? Big problem. Fade to black. <laughs> Sun comes up. Here we are, pecking away at our computer. You know, dawn is rising. We've been working all night. We have a solution. Eureka! Breakthrough. We did it. We got the answer to this big problem. It's our product and the startup we're going to build it. And we have something that's better than the competition. <laughs> Whoa! At this point, they should be coming out of their chairs. They should be, they should be clapping, right? Metaphorically. Yeah? All right. Now, you got them to the top of the hill. Keep them up there. We are the ones that can do it. Meet the team. We are us, you know? <laughs> Forgive me for quoting the president, but we are the ones you've been waiting for, right? Paraphrasing, I guess, right? Now, nuts and bolts. Don't, don't panic. Because we know how to go to market, we know our we have an operations plan. We can make money, and we can make big money. <coughs> we can start this so that it's profitable, sustainable, <coughs> and we can really grow it to where we solve this problem on a massive scale. Right? And here's and here's all we need from you. Say again. How do you adapt that one for socials? And so instead of making money, what's the? We we have we we are sustainable, right? We can fund ourselves. We can, we can do this in a way that 
when the, when the times get tough or the wind blows the other way, this thing won't crap out. Right? We've got a way to, we got a way to keep the lights on even in hard times. And, and the scale matters too. We're not going to just do it for one, one village in, in Bangladesh, right? Because once we do it there, we're going to take it to the rest of it. We're going to take it to India, right? We're going to take it to Pakistan, right? We're going to do it. We're going to solve this big, humongous problem all over the world. But for everybody, it's you've got to have solid financials, and you've got to have a, a growth path. <clears throat> and then close. Hit them with what you want. What are you asking for? Typically, you're asking for an investment to, to, to get the business to profitability. Half a million dollars, two million dollars. Now, for this contest, the <clears throat> thing you should ask for is the first place money. So this is, a, this is one of the things you would do a little bit differently if you were pitching to real investors. Your ask, in this case, is I need $35,000, you can give it to me, and here's what I'm going to do with it. Right? If you were pitching investors, you'd ask for a million dollars, and here's what you're going to do with it. Right? Say. Everybody with me so far? We were actually going to say I need $35,000. $35, Total. Okay, we'll talk about that. At least you could get some other prizes. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And, 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 I'm, and I'm not trying to talk you out of the bigger ask. So if you actually have a plan where you know what you would do with a million dollars and you know how you would get your business scale, then put that in there too. Okay, all right. Now, what are things that, get, that move them up the hill? So, so that's, I have a yes, sir. question. Sure. So, so earlier you said they're looking for 100% commitment. So You're, 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 you're an entrepreneur. You're not going to pay anybody. Okay. You're going you're to max out your credit card. You're going to eat ramen noodles. Mm -hmm. you, might, you, might hire, you might hire a programmer. Maybe you need somebody to build a website for you. Okay. You're going to have to bootstrap it. Yeah. You're, 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 your observation is correct. There's an inconsistency. <coughs> here, right? How can you get over this? This is the valley of death. This is, this is what, what all entrepreneurs, the problem all entrepreneurs right. face. So talk about how far you can, one way to do this, how far could I get with 35000 How close could I get? Could I get to a place where I had, I had some customers, I had some revenue, I had a proof of concept that might allow me to attract a half a million dollars in investment? That's another way to handle it. Yeah? All right. Things that get you up the hill. A logical progression. Go step by step by step. These people are engineers by training. They want to be able to follow this. Don't backtrack, don't contradict yourself, don't go in circles. Try to do something that A follows B follows C. Try to be organized. Help them relate to this. So they're trying to understand what you're doing. If you've got one of these cutesy little catchphrases, right? That's always nice. Uh, one of the teams um, that I liked a lot was the, the, um, the, the shared, the shared uh, tutoring service, right? And, and they had a tagline that said, we're Uber for tutors. Tuber tutors. <laughs> Uber for tutors. That's Those people in the audience say, oh, I get that. I get what you are. I know what Uber is, and I know what tutors are. And, oh, I get it. You're, you're melding those into something clever. Right? Give them touch points. They're trying to get oriented. They're trying to figure out what you are, and they want to do it fast. So try to relate to what they know. Validators are great. You guys have if you've won an award. You've done something recently. One of you. Did you guys? Somebody was at Clinton. Did you win something? No, I was in Clinton. I'm going to TCU, though. It, it's an unfair advantage. <laughs> they, they, they want, investors are, are herd animals. They want to see that other smart people also like you, right? So if you've got validators, you know, I met with Bill Gates, and he, he loves my company and wants to invest in it. If it's true, <laughs> no fibbing, no fibbing allowed here, right? Oh, we've already got an investment. They want validators. So any, anything like that moves them up the hill. What they really want is believable upside. Believable upside. Got to be both. Upside. If you tell them you've got a, a, a business that five years from now is going to be making, going to have $100,000 in revenue and you'll be making $10,000 a year, that's not upside. You, you need to have a plan that's going to show how five years, three years, eight years, you're at $5 million, $10 million business. This $100 million business. It's got to be believable. You tell them you've got a business that's going to be a billion dollars, right? You got to tell them you have a business. You're going, to, you're going to end world poverty. Not believable. Not believable. Do that balance, right? All right. 
There are things that take them down the hill very fast. The number one thing is saying things that aren't true. What's the number one thing that you say that's not, that, 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 that people that, in pitches like this say that is not true <coughs> that takes them down the hill immediately? And I'll tell you, if, if you say this on the 14th, you'll hear a big thud in the back of the room. It'll be my head falling on the table. <laughs> you know what it is? We have no competition. <laughs> if you say we have no competition, you will see every judge there take out their their Palm Pilot and start doing their email. They're gone. They are gone. Yes, ma'am. Question. Just wondering. So if Steve Jobs pitched Apple and Mac and all that, he, he could say he had no competition. No, he had plenty. He I didn't. Mean, those are other computers, but none like that one. People. Here's why I say by definition you can't say he had no competition. People are doing something now to deal with this. Whatever the problem is you have, they're doing something. And it may stink. It may really suck. And that, it, yeah, so that's better for you. But whatever they're doing now is the competition, at, at a minimum. Or what else they're doing with their mind, if it's, a, if it's an extraneous gift. Sure. If, so if you have an entertainment gift, you're competing with everybody else who offers any kind of entertain, entertainment venture, right? So never say that. But. <laughs> Never exaggerate. Never, never talk about things that, that you're not sure of. It's okay to say I don't know. If, if they ask you a question and you don't know the answer, don't bluff. Don't get caught. Remember, number one thing they're judged is you. Number one thing they're judging about you is mushy language. I read some of your plans. You guys got to get rid of the mushy language. <laughs> if you've done so, here. So remember. Remember thing one and thing two, right? When they're in thing two mode, <coughs> they think everything you're telling them is BS. And they're very skeptical. So if you say, I've done over 100 interviews, how do they translate that? <laughs> no, because they, they, they don't think you lied. They think you did 101, right? And that you're bullshitting them, right? You're trying to say, oh, I did a over 100 when you did over 100 by that much. If you did 101 interviews, say I did 101 interviews. The other thing is, don't use the present tense when you mean the future tense. So don't say, our app brings people together um, and helps them find uh, all their friends in the park if you haven't built the app yet. <laughs> our app will bring people together and help them find their friends in the park. <coughs> don't use the present if you're talking about the future. Don't mush up, is the thing live or not? Don't be ambiguous about that because they're cynical bastards and they think you're lying to them. They don't realize that you're just being careless with language. They think you're trying to put something over on them. So the best of intentions, you're going to lose. All right. Don't tell them things they don't understand. That's a tough one. Because in this audience, in this group of judges, you've got really smart techie people and you, you better not talk down to them but you've got people who are not very techie and if and if you if you blow by them and they don't understand what you're talking about they'll be lost all the time and they'll, they'll be spent when they should be listening to your financials when they should be listening to your your go-to-market strategies they'll still be trying to think about how does this thing really work i don't really understand and we'll talk about some of the things you got to read their faces that's why you got to know these judges you got to pitch things at a level where they can get it but you don't talk down to them. It's tricky to do. All right. Inconsistencies will kill you. If you say on slide one our revenue in the first year is going to be $500,000, and on slide 10 you say on the first year our revenue is $600,000, even in one of them was, it was gross revenue, one of them is net revenue, and it's completely consistent, they think it's inconsistent. Make sure you're, you're absolutely consistent all the way through. I mean, leave a day to go through your deck and check it for consistency. It's really important. And then some of the obvious stuff, typos, errors, misspellings, right? You run spell check. You know, don't spell their names wrong. Don't, don't do this kind of sloppy stuff because they, they'll infer that you're a sloppy person, <coughs> that you're careless. Nobody wants to invest in somebody who's careless. All right. all right, all right. Now, let's do some work. The actual pitch deck. Does everybody have a hand out of the pitch deck? 18 slides, 12 minutes. Can you get one for Jeffrey, please? Do you have extra?
Everybody should, there's plenty of them. So everybody needs to have one of these in their hands because the, 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 the print on the screen is too small. I'm going to violate the 25. I violated the 25 point rule. All right. So here's the first half. Note here the narrative arc, right? It starts with framing. I'll come back and talk about framing. I strongly recommend that everybody use a framing slide as their first slide. I'll tell you a secret. One of the, one of the judges on the panel, Dan, Dan Gordon, writes a blog about how to pitch investors. If I were you, I might look for Dan's blog and read it. Just saying. Dan talks about a framing slide. I stole this from him. You'd be crazy not to put a framing slide in your deck. Here's the arc, right? There's a need, big need. It's an opportunity because it's not being addressed right now. And we have a solution. <coughs> so I'm spending a minute and a half of our precious 12 minutes talking about the problem. And I'm spending three minutes tops. And you'll see why that might be a little high in a minute, talking about the solution. And then I'm telling them in 30 seconds, quantitatively how big this market is. That's up the hill. Now, now let, not let them down. We can win. We can make money. We can implement. Here's a quick summary of hitting all the high points. And there's my close the ask. Right? That's my arc. Up the hill. Keep them there until we close. All right. Let's go back through it. First, first slide. So never let it be said that Lex told you how to game the, the competition. But there's some things you can do. So for example, your first slide should, should show a logo if you have a logo, maybe some pictures of the team, even a picture of the product and a tagline or something. And you put that up while you're setting up. Because then the clock's not running yet, right? So Denise is going to be changing the mics and all this stuff. But your slide is up there and they're reading it. Right? So steal a few seconds up in, up in the front giving, getting them organized. Don't tell them I told you that. Right? Framing slide. You've got to get them oriented. They, they see hundreds of pitches. They don't know you from Adam. Get them into the right ballpark. Right? Get them into the right church. Don't have to be like in the pew, maybe, but get them into the, the right area. The basic things are your 50-word pitch. Right? Deliver that. Some variation of it. Remember, remember the structure of it, right? It's what's, our, what's the problem, who do we serve, and how do we make money? Tell them that quickly. That gets them, that gets them more. They want to know what your product is. It helps them to think. It helps them to fit everything else they're going to hear into a, into a structure. Yes, ma'am. Do they know us? Were they also judges for the finalists? No. This is a completely new set of judges. Oh, all right. Uh, in terms of logistics, I will send them <coughs> your round two business plans. I cannot promise you that they will read them. Oh, really? Okay. I, 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 I don't have that much sway over them. I think they will. I don't. I can't promise you. Yes, sir. Can we add edits if we like have edited since like our last yes. submission? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. I, oh. I. I don't know. I, that, that, that's a, that's an, a good question. Fair to ask. I don't know when I'm going to send them. I, I, it probably won't be this week. So you've got a couple more days. But when I send, I'm going to send them. Yes, ma'am. No, good because I noticed there's one error where we left something out that used to be in the pro forma that suddenly isn't there anymore. Yeah. All right. Well, send it to me for sure. Um, let's see thing. Oh, and, and obviously you want to, you want to, you might want to incorporate some of the feedback into it. Right? Mm -hmm. So I, I get why you might want to update yeah. it. Fair question. All right. So use a, sh a framing slide. Then I spend a minute and a half here on the on the need. Um, and and I think these are actually our words I would consider using as the title of the slide. You don't have to obviously, but he want to talk about the major trends. What what. Um, what's going on? What does it appeal to their head? Tell, tell them facts, but you've got to appeal to their heart as well, right? Got to tell them a good story. Um, sometimes it, this is a good time to talk about how they're dealing with the problem now, especially for the, the, the socials, right? What, there's a big problem. People are dying. There's a disease. What are they doing about it now? They, are they just, maybe they're just accepting it. I doubt it. There must be some kind of a, 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 a poorly baked, partially baked solution that's out there now. It's a good way to show that you know the environment. Then talk about your solution. 30 seconds on the product. A 30 second description, 30 seconds, and that's, that's a good number. Talk about features and benefits. Spend a very limited time on the technology. A, a, 
common, common mistake that pitch, uh, pitchers make in their first early pitches is they fall in love with the solution. Right? It's what you've really been working on. You love it. It's your app. It's your baby. You really want to talk about that a lot. You've got 12 minutes. It's worth 30 seconds. And frankly, <coughs> you want to talk about features and benefits. Right? Talk about why it's good for the other people. Now, you've got to make sure they know how it works. So this is, this is a tough one. Think about how you convey to them what your product does. And there's lots of ways to do it. There's lots of pros and cons. Screenshots is a good one. Sometimes flow charts. How do people use it? You can, you can do it in, in, a, in a flow. Uh, you might want to use a video. Tough call to use a video. Video should not be very long. 20, if, you can do, if you can video it in 20 seconds or 30 seconds, might be worth doing. If it's, if it's, I've seen pictures like this where the product is hard to conceptualize, but if you see it, you get it in, in 30 seconds. In that case, a video would be good for you. <coughs> Quick question. Under what circumstances should you do a live demo? None. Never! Oh, really? Never! <laughs> Remember the head thudding on the back? If you do a live demo, I'll come down and just tackle you right there. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll pull the fire alarm in the building. I'll do something. <laughs> Don't do a live demo. They never work. <laughs> they never work. Not once in the history of pitching has a live demo ever worked. Videotape it. Do it canned and videotape it. If, if a demo is what you need, video it and show it a canned demo. All right. So we can embed videos in the slides is yes. what you're saying? Because that was one of our Absolutely, yes. Issues. Uh, test it, test it, test it. Test Come it. a half an hour early to make sure it works. And even then, there's only like an 80% chance it'll work. But yes, yes. So here's one. It, the buyer ecosystem. Several of you have medical applications. The buyer ecosystem for selling in hospitals is really tough. And these people will know that. And you're going to have to invest I don't know if it's a minute, but you're going to have to invest some time in this solution, showing them that you know how the doctors and the CIO and the medical staff and the nursing staff and the foundation that support the doctors, how they play a role in the purchase decision, the insurance companies. Right? And I'm looking at you, but you're not alone. Um, I suspect for, this, for the socials that's true too, right? Because you've got funders and buyers and you've got you to make sure that it's clear where your money is going to come from, that you want, are smart enough to know that ecosystem, right? So it, look, if, if you've got an app and you're selling it on the, on the internet, big deal, right? You just, you, just, you just saved yourself a minute. You can use it somewhere else, right? At this point, I talk about what we did to verify our customer development. These folks are going to want to know that, that, that you have tested this in the marketplace. So if you have revenue, the best, thing, the best, best way to say testing the revenue is that people are buying it. It's out there. We're selling, selling like hotcakes. If you don't have revenue, you better have the next best thing, which is lots of customer interviews, even testimonials. So think about, think about. It's risky here, but some quotes, a video quote, right? So if you're if you're selling your, your, your um, social venture to the World Bank. And you've got, a 30, you've got a 15 second or a 20 second video from the head of the World Bank saying, I love this thing and I can't wait to buy it. Well, I put that video in my, in my talk, right? And I, we did 112 interviews. Let me just show you one we did with the head of the World Bank. Go. We love this app. We've got to have it. It's the best thing since sliced bread. Bang. You're off stage and you sold them, right? So testimonials from customers are good. Talk about interviews. Um, the value proposition. Part of your solution is the value proposition. Make sure you talk about the value proposition. That in terms of value, not, not features, not benefits, value. How does it make money, save money, save time, help those customers? Right? We've been through this in our business model canvas this way a bit. All right. Uh, let's see. Addressable market is large. One slide served. <coughs> total served in target markets, right? The concentric circles. You've all got those stupid charts. Put one up there, show that it's a $100 billion market, $200 billion market. Got to have it. It's, it's required. Don't spend more than 30 seconds on it. Next. Now, now we can win. Barriers to entry. 
got to have a slide. It's the, in fact, use those terms. Social is not so much. You have a patent. You have some kind of know-how. You have some expertise that other people don't have. You have special relationships. You've got exclusive deals. You've locked up a supplier. <coughs> you've already got an exclusive contract with a customer. You know you've got a, uh, a bank who will lend you money. Anything that, that gives you an advantage over the marketplace and, and makes it, will make it harder for competitors to get in there. Get a slide on that. Yes? Which one is TAM, SAM, and TAM? So TAM is the total available market. If you could sell your product to everybody in the world, how big would that market be? And you might say it's, you know, it's two million people who, so for you guys it's gonna be, it's the population, seniors over, uh, over 55. The served market is what market you're gonna, you actually could serve, right? So you're not gonna get the seniors in, in Europe, maybe not anytime soon, right? You're gonna get the US or you're gonna get the Northeast. So it's, it's what market you can get reasonably with the product you have. And then target is who you're going to do in the next year. Who is it you're really going to go after okay. right away? First, the first group, the first market you're going to go after and try to capture. So that's why we do kind of concentric So it's circles. like a customer segmentation. Yes, absolutely. All right, barriers to entry. Uh, then, routine stuff, go to market plan. Here's how we're going to, here's how we're going to, we're going to start by selling on the web, then we're going to go to the national sales, and then we're going to uh, <coughs> hire a distributor network. How do, you, how do you get your product out there? Yes, sir. Yeah. It's, 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 it's how do you find, how are you going to find your beneficiaries and how are you going to find your funders? So th th that's the selling that you've got to do. Right? So if, you, if you've got nonprofits or NGOs that are going to fund this thing, how do you get them? You're going to, you're going to run an ad, you're, going to, you're probably going to call on them, right? It's, it's, shoe leather is probably the answer for you. Guys, right? um, now, notice that back to answer your question, I talked about the team in the framing slide. So to answer your question, um, I would introduce everybody on the team early on, maybe but like name and title. In fact, we'll talk a little later. One of the things you want to do, it's a little bit hokey, but it works. As you walk into the room, go down the aisle and shake the hands of every judges. I mean, literally connect. It's, it's, it's a good way to build rapport, make eye contact. How do you do, sir? How do you do, ma'am? and it's before the clock starts. Mm -hmm. okay. When you do your framing slide, I would include a picture of everybody on the team with a title, maybe some, some credential. Right. At this point, when you're now you're talking about the team, now you go into some depth here. So here's where you talk about industry strength, right? Do you know the industry? Do you know the market? Do you know the local culture, right? If, you, if, you're, if, you're gonna, if you've got a product that you're selling in Algeria, Talk about what you know about Algeria, right? Uh, any kind of entrepreneurial experience you've had, any kind of technical expertise that you have, things that are relevant to making the vision go. Got to have a slide on that, spend full 30 seconds. Now you're starting to close. Why us, why now is always a good one. And the answer is almost always the same, right? We have the, the technology, we have the passion, we have the resources, we have the team. We're fired up, we're ready to go, right? Starting to recap. The ask, I talked about this a little bit. Um, I, I think about how I play this. I don't have really good advice on this. It, you probably should show that, that what you would ask for in a real venture pitch. So if you have a plan to get to $100 million and it takes $2 million of investment over the next two years, an ask like that would be, would be fine, would be a sensible thing to include here. The psychology of it is that, that this is where they, they depart from being real funders. They know they're judging the business plan competition at GW. And so in the back of their minds, they're thinking, gee, could this team go, f go a long way with 35 large? So you want to tell them a story for what you're going to do with that 35 grand when you win. And frankly, and I know life sucks, the team with a really great plan to get to $100 million is, is not going to on this dimension, it's not going to score as well as a team that could really use that 35 grand to get their website and get their first customer. Sorry, that's the psychology of the judges and the nature of the task. So tell them, tell them what you're going to do with that money. And then summarize, and the summary is always the same. I'm telling you. Here's the problem. We told you about the solution we have. We can beat the competition. We've got strong financial, I didn't talk about the financials, I skipped over it. 
Sorry, backtracking. This is what you're never supposed to do, right? Go backwards, logical progression. Sorry. Show your, show your slide, show your, your income statement, your one slide income statement, and then give them the highlights. And the highlights are usually of this form. Revenue grows nicely over the next five years. You know, by 2017, we'll be at $13 million in sale. That's what they're looking for. How does revenue grow? So read the top line to them. Interpret the top line, right? We exceed, in, by, by year three, we exceed the benchmark gross margins. Remember, remember uh, Steve Rogers talked about the, the gross margins that they're looking for in your industry? They know your industry. They know the analogs. So find out what products like you, what kind of gross margins there are in products like yours, and give them that warm, fuzzy feeling that you're going to hit or exceed those gross margins. Don't blow away those gross margins. Remember, it's, it's that believable upside. If the, if the target gross margin in your industry is 60%, don't tell them you're going to get 90%. Even if you think you can, don't tell them that. That's, that's my ethic. I've, I've broken my ethical rule. Yes, sir? So if you're taking a lean startup approach, say, you know, I, I'm really not going to get a billion <coughs> a year, <coughs> is it OK to admit that and say, I'm actually starting realistic, and I think I can get, I'm doing social stuff, but yeah, yeah. I'm, if I was in the, I can really get 500 customers this year and over five years up to, or should, how do you balance that? So their expectation of you is that you are very early stage. Okay. And they want to see an achievable plan, in the, a realistic achievable plan in the first year, two, even three years. So when I say you're going to get to be a $10 million company or you're going to get to be a $50 million company, I would be astounded. <coughs> and they would be too if anybody <coughs> shows anything like that within five years. They want to see something that you can really accomplish in the first year. So none of you should be, uh, should be conquering the world in the first year. Uh, go ahead. Um, Touching on gross margins, uh, we have a few competitors in the market that are different in a key way that causes their overhead to skyrocket. Mm -hmm. uh, the example is that they, they hire a series of court reporters to transcribe <coughs> things in person, which we do not. Mm -hmm. If we don't have that series of overhead, so like, for example, one of our competitors spent $100 million building their product and we spent oh, not yeah. nearly that Less. much. Um, so the question is, is our gross margin, um, even when we get three, four years out, will be dramatically different than those competitors, should those competitors actually still exist? So this is one of those things that makes you <coughs> very distinctive from the competition. So when you talk about the competition, you want to invest time in explaining this. Right. And do it slowly and carefully and make sure they understand it. When you get to this slide, you want to reiterate that very point. Okay. You want to say, notice that our gross margins are different from the industry. And that's because, as I told you before, blah, blah, cool. blah, blah, blah. Great. It allows you to emphasize you, one of your special points, and it, and it, and it explains away <coughs> a, a, a potential inconsistency. Right? And it shows that you're knowledgeable. It shows that you understand, anticipate the question. Yes, ma'am. So if in our market research there were things portions of things that were similar to what we're proposing, but nothing, I can't find a gross margin for something that's exactly like what we want to do. So we can talk about growth. I mean, we did in our appendices in certain segments of the market, mm -hmm. uh, but not. I think about analogs. Think about other service companies that are not <coughs> doing what you're doing, but are an analogous. Yes, I have a question. Sir. So, um, if you mentioned early stage, so, so we are really early stage, we have a team, <laughs> uh, and uh, we don't have an entity, uh, we have a domain, <laughs> we have websites, uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, technology development, mm. part of other pro projects and so on, so how do we position ourselves, um, like in the early slide, you said, you know, put your team, so it's just a team at this point, I mean, we don't have an entity, so. So your challenge so you guys will do very good, very well at explaining your technology, explaining the problem. You've got to do well in this competition. You're going to have to show that you really thought through the business aspects of this. You don't have to have done any of it. But you're going to have to show lots of thought has gone into it. So you want to have a, for you, it, you know, it's, it's a business plan competition. You've got to have a really good <coughs> plan around the business side. You'll be, you'll be persuasive around the technology, I have no doubt. Unfortunately, I've got to pick up the pace. Close, 
Yeah, sorry, let's go. Uh, the art of the Q&A. All right, let me talk about this. This is important. 40% of the time is spent in Q&A, right? Very important. You cannot possibly con con convey all the important stuff you have in the 12 minutes you have. <coughs> Can't be done. Okay, so you've got to pick and choose. You've got to be smart. The Q&A is your chance to fill in the gaps, to give them information that you couldn't give in the talk. And the beauty of it is you do it, you let them guide you to what they want to know. So their questions are going to tell you what the most important gaps are in your talk. And you use that as an opportunity to fill in the gap, right? So they're helping you out at this point. The most important skill is to listen, active listening, right? Get the question. Don't answer the question until you get the question. Tell me something. Tell me something about yourself. I'm a registered nurse. You're a registered nurse. You're a registered nurse and you work in, in D.C.? No, I'm not. So tell me, make, make sure I understand. A registered nurse is different from a uh, licensed practical nurse? Yes, it is. Okay. So you're a registered nurse. I, I understand what you're telling me now. A dopey example, but I played back to her what I heard. I didn't launch into my answer to the question she didn't ask until I was absolutely <coughs> sure that I understood the question, and she nodded and verified that what I was telling her back was what she was telling me. Right? It's active listening. I heard her, and I played it back. That's good use of your time in the Q&A. You can lose much, all of your Q&A, by answering the, a different question than the one they ask. Don't be afraid to invest time in getting the question right. Now, you get three kinds of questions in Q&A, three kinds. <coughs> one is not good. One is good and one is great. The one that's not good is the I didn't get it question. Right? You've been at it for 12 minutes and the first question is, I still don't understand how your system works. That's an oh heck moment. But you can recover. You got, you got, you got uh, eight minutes to recover. Invest your time in that. Go back over. Generally, it's not a good idea to go back to the slides. Uh, if you have a demo or something that, that can help you, maybe you go back. But if you get that question, I didn't, I didn't follow it, I didn't understand it, Go after that person and take two, three minutes and explain it. Get them back up the hill. It's your only hope. <coughs> the second kind of question you get is, is not, not so bad. It's the I'm smarter than you question. And it often comes around competition. By the way, do you know about the XYZ company? They're doing something very similar to what you're doing. Right? I know the XYZ company and you don't. <laughs> I'm a smart VC. And I just want to make, I want to let you and the other people on the, on the, on the other judges know that I'm very smart. Not a bad question, because it gives you an opportunity to show that you've done your homework and you know this. They're not going to ask you anything you don't know. If they do say, no, I don't know that company, it's very interesting, I'd like to follow up on it. If you don't know, you don't know. If you do know, take a minute, 30 seconds, you don't have a minute or anything. Say, yes, I know the XYZ company. We've looked at them extensively. They have two products that are similar to ours, but ours are much better on these three dimensions. And while we think there will be a formidable competitor in the future, we are, we are confident that we can, uh, can beat them because of this competitive advantage. Bang, you're done. Right? Now, you've trumped the smartest guy in the room, right? You're smarter than he is because you know the XYZ company, and you've looked at him and you know how it compares to your company. You are smart, smart, smart. You know the industry, right? Do you know what, what the XYZ company is doing in Bangladesh, it's similar to what you're doing. It is similar, and we've looked at them. It's not the same in these important distinct, in these important dimensions, and here's why. Right. Okay. The final question is the one you want to get. It's the implementation questions. Tell me again, how are you going to capture the international market? The implication <coughs> of this question is, I bought in. I think you can do it. I'm up the hill. I'm with you. I love your product. I love your solution. I love your team. Tell me more about how you're going to do it. I really want to know how you're going to get out there. When are you going? Show me your timeline. When do you get to France? Are you going to start in France? When you go to Europe, are you going to be in France or are you going to go to England first? Why did you pick France rather than England? They want to know how, how fast you can go. They love you. They bought in. That's the kind of questions you want. Now, 
Here's how you answer the questions. Literally come forward. <coughs> Bring the whole team up to the judges to answer the questions. Again, take time to get the questions. Always polite and respectful, crisp, concise answers. Here's the logic of it. You give short, well thought out answers. If you give short answers, you get more questions. If you get more questions, you get to give more answers. And your more answers fill in more of the missing pieces for the judges. It's always in your interest to give a crisp, concise answer and get on to the next question. In the eight minutes you have, you want to answer 20 <coughs> questions. You don't want to answer four, because then you've squandered your eight minutes. You only answered four questions. There's 12 judges, and they've all got three questions apiece. You're not going to get to all of them anyway. Crisp, punctuated answers. Never be defensive. If they give you a question like, I don't really think you understand the XYZ market. You smile and say, don't give them the stink eye, you know? <laughs> right? That body language that says, you know, F you, buddy, I understand it real well. <laughs> don't give them that. Don't give them that. It's, it's, a, it's an uneven situation, right? You're not peers in this. They're judges and you're being judged. Smile, polite, never get defensive. Just take a step back, give a thoughtful answer, say, I'm sorry to hear you say it. I'm sorry you think that. Here's why we think it really is a good idea, but thank you for your comment. Here's another homework assignment. Anticipate the questions. Write down 10 questions. Everyone on the team writes down 10 questions you're going to get after the talk and rehearse and have those answers ready for them in a 15 to 20 second format. It's not that tough. You, you actually will know the questions they're going to ask. You, you know where you'll find them is in the judge's feedback for round two. Every judge that took a shot at you in round two, that's one of the questions you're going to get. Have an answer for that question ready. right? And think of 10 more. You know the weaknesses. You know when, when you're giving the talk, you say, gee, this, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna have to skate through here a little bit. <clears throat> These are sharp people. That's what they're going to ask you. But they're going to go zinging right in on, on every weak point in your talk. They'll find it. That's what they do for a living. Right? These people make money. They put food on the table by finding the weaknesses in pitches. So you're not going to get by them. You're not going to get over on them. Get ready for those questions and have them ready to go. All right. Q&A. Is what, is what separates the winners from the also-rans in this competition. Everybody does a good pitch. I know you'll do a good pitch. All right, time is short. Where are we? Other approaches, quickly. They're in the deck. Lilo Sitterman is a, a, a pitch coach in Silicon Valley, does a very nice uh, video. Here's the video. Uh, here's what she says, 28-point font. So she's big, and, and you're going to see lots yeah. of these folks on the sparse slides. Three, three, three bullets on a slide. She's big on know your audience, and she's, she's, her, her mantra is don't fall in love with your solution slide. We've talked about this already. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press on. Here's her 10 slide deck. The problem, the solution, the addressable market. You recognize all of these. I'm going to rush through them. Note that it starts with the problem and the solution. Right? All right, next one. Guy Kawasaki, a uh, uh, big venture capitalist out in, in Berkeley. Uh, 10, 20, 30 rule. 10 slides, no more than 20 minutes, 30 point font for him. He's in that less text school. I don't subscribe to that, others do. So please, Sonny, take this into consideration. I'm, I'm a bit of an outlier on, on slides. I like, I'm an engineer, I like slides that are a little meaty. These guys don't. Um, let's see, here's his deck. Whoop, problem and the solution, business model. What he calls underlying magic, we've been calling competitive advantage. Right? He's good. All right, next. David S. Rose, this is the guy I talked about before. This is the king of the pitch coaches. Uh, he says, VCs are most interested in you. Right? Build connection. Again, sparse slides. Here's his deck. He uses a bigger deck. Um, these slides are a little bit not quite different for you. He, he, he wants to see a valuation of the company. None of you needs to worry about evaluating your company at this point. Uh, Audience Choice Award. Let's go quickly through that. Uh, we're running out of time. Audience Choice Award is very, very different, right? Because the audience is very, very different. During the day, it's 12 hard-nosed <coughs> hard VCs. In the afternoon, it's all your fraternity buddies, right? It's going to be wild. It's going to be out there. It's, it's completely different. They are younger, less skeptical, more accepting, right? 
they want to just go up the hill. It's easy. So for the, for the socials, it's easier for you, right? Because you, you, you want to appeal to their hearts, get them all excited about uh, the do-gooder thing you're doing. You got an unfair advantage. But take advantage of it, put it to use, right? They want to be entertained, form, showmanship is going to matter to these folks. The visuals will matter much more. So here is a place even I would use sparse visuals. Lots of, lots of graphics, very few bullets. You must connect with everybody in the room, right? So you've got to play large. It's not shaking the hands of 12, 12 people in the front row. You've got to reach into that audience. You've got to be memorable. So if the luck, in the luck of the draw, if you're second or first, by the time they've seen 10 more, they can remember, your, they can remember you from Adam. You've got to do something that sticks with them through, through eight other presentations so that when it comes time to vote at the end, they say, boy, those last three were really good, and I kind of remember them. But those guys that were number, number two, right, they wore the silly hats and they danced and whatever. You've got to be memorable. You've got to stick out to win that prize. And the time is short. So rehearse, 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 practice, practice, practice. Practice with a stopwatch, because when the time is up, you're going to get the hook. There's no, uh, there's no going over on this. All right. Here's a place where I do believe in the sparse slides. Who's this guy? Anybody recognize him? The late Steve Jobs. So here's how he pitches to the, uh, when he's pitching to the stockholders of, of Apple. What, what kind of font is that? That's like 114th font. Right? <laughs> That's all he's got, 30 million iPhones. But he, he subscribes to the, the sparse slides. All right, all right. General advice. Holy cow, we got five minutes for the most important part. Yes, sir. For the uh, when we're presenting in front of a bigger audience, they're going to be asking questions as well. Yeah, the mechanics of it are a little different. Uh, <coughs> there's a there's a, an, an app that we use to to manage the whole event. So everybody's going to have a and it's going to have your profiles, your pictures. It's going to have your slide deck in it. Mm -hmm. It's going to have uh, pictures of the judges. It's going to have the agenda. And, it, and there's a, a, a utility in there where they can submit questions. So when you're doing your five-minute pitch, they're, they're typing questions from the audience. We will have a, a moderator who will pick two or three of them and ask them from the back of the room. So you don't show your slides again? Um, they have the slides. I, 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 my intention is to give them the slides you used during the day with the uh, formal judges. But we don't have to use slides. You don't have to use slides, absolutely not. We can just pitch it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You might want to. Or we just pick out a few of the slides to show. Can we make a shorter Any and all of the above. <coughs> Sir. Quick question. Um, are we like doing like pre-promotion to like for people to come to the event, but like you're promoting your own business so they can come? I would. Okay, just wondering. Just wondering. I I packed the room. Okay. Personally. What room is it? And. <laughs> How many seats are there? It's, uh, it's the auditorium in SEH. It's that big glass fishbowl downstairs. There are 196 seats. It, there's an online registration. Right? Or no? uh, there is. There's an online registration through uh, Eventbrite right now. For voting, you're going to have to register with the, uh, with the event app. And that's not ready yet. It won't be for another week or two. All right, we've got we to pick up the pace. I'm really sorry. I want to talk about, oh, oh so here's, here's the reason we don't have, we won't have to worry about this too much. Linda Maddox, a professor in the business school here, d did a talk last year on uh, advice for presenters. There's the URL at the bottom. It's on our website. It's, 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 uh, it's on the business plan website. She goes into much more detail on this, does it, frankly, does a better job on this than I'm going to do. Uh, she's really an expert on this. So to, to get into this aspect of it, I, I strongly recommend you go and look at the video uh, of Linda. So I want to talk about fear of presenting, why you're presenting, your purpose, some meta issues, the uh, elements of your presentation, and then dealing with stress and anxiety. And we'll finish up eh, maybe five minutes late. Let's, let's jump in. All right. How many of you have made a presentation like this before? Do you like it? Do you enjoy it? Sometimes. The smaller one. Yeah. How, many, how, many, how many have never done it before? Afraid of it? A little bit. Let's go to the ones who've done it before and like it. Your problem is you talk too much. Don't like it too much. So those of you who, who uh, get up there and really are digging it, you're going to have problems. You've got to constrain yourself. You've got to live within the constraints. You've got to get 
precise and to the point. For those of you who are afraid of it, one way, one thing you gotta do right away is be sensitized. So do the dolphin tank. Get up and try it. Try it and do it. It, it gets easier, trust me, it gets easier. The good news is you are the expert in you, right? You are the expert in this, in this venture. You know more than anybody else in the room about this stuff. And you can do this. I, I know you can do it. Try. If you want to come by, I'll practice with you. If you know anybody who practice with you, I'll practice with you. Come by office hours and we'll do it. All right, so why are you presenting? What is the purpose of your presentation? Is it to inform and educate? Yeah, sure it is, sure it is. To persuade, are you trying to persuade these folks to pick you, pick me, pick me? Of course it is. But it's way more than that, it's way more than that. If you think it, it's only those two things, you'll play too small on this stage. You've got to get beyond that. You've got to entertain, you've got to inspire, and you've got to cause them to take action. You win in this at the end when, when they say, gee, come see me afterwards because I want to hook you up with my brother-in-law who works in this industry and knows a lot about this. Or come see me because I want to talk to you. I think I'm interested in investing in your company. That's what you really want to get out of these people. So if you shoot for, inform, and educate and persuade, you're shooting too low. Now, here are the meta issues. Connect, connect, connect. Eye contact is very important. So some people tell you, you know, pick a spot in the room and talk to the wall. <coughs> it ain't it. Make eye contact with these people. And eye contact means three seconds. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. Right? Got to do it, even if it's uncomfortable. I find faces compelling. It is difficult for me, you know, Yogi said you can't think and hit. I, I can't talk and look at somebody's faces, face, because I start thinking about all sorts of things. It's <laughs> like, are you Irish? Because you look like my grandmother. Really like, oh, thank you. Uh, and all of a sudden, my head goes mushy. So it's tough for me. I have to force myself to make eye contact. You do, too. Be authentic. Let the real you come through. We talked about that. Show enthusiasm, calibrate your internal monitor. When I give a talk and I think that I'm full of life and full of energy and doing it just about right and it feels good to me and I look at myself on videotape, I say, that guy's really dull. My internal monitor, when it's on hit really good, it, it means I'm doing kind of sluggish. I gotta crank it up. I gotta feel like I'm making a fool of myself. I gotta feel like I'm dancing around and being a real jackass. Because when I feel that way, and I look at the video, I say, that's the guy I wanna be. That's the right talk. Calibrate yourself. That's why I do it on video. Give the talk and think, how did I feel when I was given that talk? And get that feeling to match up with the video that you want on the screen. Even if, if conceptually, it doesn't seem right. Calibrate yourself, yeah? All right. Hard work. From now on, what's, what's today? April, it's March 18th to April 14th. You all got feedback from the judges. I'm sure there are things you have to fix. I know things you all have to fix in, in your presentations. Fix them. Spend at least half the time you spend working on this over the next month on your presentation. If you can spend 90%, it's better. Fix the stuff you gotta fix, I get, I get that. You know, if you gotta go to the library and find out your TAM and your SAM, your target market, go talk to Shmuel and figure it out, because you gotta have it. Spend a lot of time on this presentation. Rehearse, 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 rehearse. When you give the talk, when you're in front of the group, you have a, a finite amount of cognitive energy and ability. There's only so much thinking you're gonna be able to do standing up in front of those folks. If you're using up that thinking power to say, what is it, what's next? What slide is next? What am I supposed to say on this slide? What am I thinking about? That'll use it all up, and you'll look like I do here, beating my head. You want to have that stuff so natural, right? The talk, the words, the flow, that you spend all your time thinking about your presentation and your gestures and how you use silence and where you block out on the, on the stage. When actors deliver Shakespeare, they're not sitting up there saying, oh my God, what's the next line? I really should have studied more. They're working on, on all, the, all the gestures, all the action, all the, the physical part of it. 
They're not thinking about what the next line is. That's why I say you got to do this 10 times. You've got to practice it so that the, the speaking part is automatic baseball. And when you're up there, you're just doing the show. Are you with me? Yes, ma'am. Who advances the slides? Do you have to do it yourself? You do it yourself. Get a clicker. Okay. There'll be a clicker. All right. Content. We talked about the narrative arc. Got to have a narrative arc. Got to tell a story. You're a storyteller. Handout. Should you have a handout? I'm like 80-20 against handouts. And the problem, the problem with handouts is they take the handout, they read the handout, they're not paying attention to you. You've lost control of what they're thinking of. Sometimes if you have something that's really tricky that can't be displayed on the slide because it's a complicated model of a network, or maybe your financials are so detailed that, though frankly I wouldn't even do them. If you have to use a handout, you better have a really good reason. I'm against handouts. Samples. Samples are good. If you can give them part of your product and, and, and give them something they can hold, the thing is you've got to manage the time. So if you give them a sample in there, playing around with it, trying it on, or eating it, or whatever they do, and they're not paying attention to you, then the, then the sample hasn't helped you. If, if the sample makes it easy and fast for them to get what your product is, then give them a sample. A demo. When is it OK to do a live demo? Never. 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 OK. <laughs> Verbal, the words. So here's why you've got to spend so much time on this over the next couple of weeks. You've got to squeeze it down. You've got to get the words to be really concise. You know, th this quote from Twain, he wasn't the first to say this, but there's a lot of truth to this, right? I didn't have time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long one instead, right? You've got to make this really concise and crisp, and yeah, that's hard work. Got to do it, though. Voice matters a lot, right? This is the theater of it. This is what you've got to practice. You want to have your voice rise and fall. You want to use dramatic pauses. When you get to the point where there's something really important, really important, the really important thing is use of silence. Right? Take, it's called taking a beat, right? That, that pause gets everybody in the room to stop and think and pay attention, and then you deliver the next thing, right? Use silence. The other thing is, is to use, you want to have a, a voice that can be heard, <clears throat> But using, using, using a quiet voice is also important because sometimes something that's so important that it can be whispered will have more, more effect on the audience. Okay? Don't be shy about using this stuff. This is, this is drama. You're on stage. All right. <clears throat> images are important. The more images you use, the better. <clears throat> pictures worth 1,000 words. Actually, the science is a picture's worth like 60,000 words. Use pictures wherever you can. We talked about video. Video is tough to set up, tough to use. Video, use it if you can. Uh, cons common, uh, consistent look and feel along your slides. Your slides are branded, right? Make them readable. Use big point. Slide mechanics, you asked about this. Uh, use a remote control. Do not look at the screen. And I know I look at the screen a lot. Don't look at the screen. Um, do not read. You may not read. Do not read. <coughs> In terms of notes, oh, we got to right, quit. Um, <coughs> It's, if you, can, you should not speak for notes. If you have to have a set of notes in your pocket as a, as a security blanket, you can do that. You cannot speak for notes. All right. Dress the part. What is this guy trying to tell you? He's hip. He's countercultural, right? He's not a business guy. What are these guys trying to tell you? They are hip, but they're business students, right? They, what are these guys trying to tell you? This is a team that, that won one year. Tell me, tell me what you know about this team. They got one business nerd and one doctor. <laughs> That's who they are. And I want you to know that, right? I think this tie was fashionable. Then, so. all right, all right. You present as a team, practice as a team. I'm sorry to run through this. Uh, figure out your lap times. Know where you need to be at 10 minutes, two minutes left. All right. Uh, dealing with stress. I, I, I'm just out of time. I'm really sorry. I apologize. We, 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 we got to vacate the room. Sorry, team. The slides are available on, on the website. Thanks. Linda Maddox is. Uh, Web uh, video does a very good job of the stuff. Oh, that we, we, we do that. Um, uh